So I've been speaking about this notion of craft in web design for a couple of years now. Um, and for me, for a while, it was a personal kind of discovery. I wanted to try and make sense of that. So I'll share some thoughts with you today that I've discovered that matter to me. Ultimately, this is quite personal to me. And I think each of us sitting there today and beyond, we have to kind of reconcile this idea, this notion that craft is relevant to each of us in web design. It's not a perfect fit, but it's a useful fit. It benefits me as an individual who cares deeply about what I do to kind of base it in this idea of craft. It helps me and it guides me. So I'll be looking at a few things like that today. So I've spoken about this stuff before um, at Build Conference last year. Um, I sort of concluded this little investigation I've been on, uh, talking about this idea of craft through the metaphor of bricks and brick laying, um, thinking a lot about tools, our understanding of tools in web design, something that we get right and we definitely, definitely get wrong, and various other things. And there's a good talk on Vimeo. If you search for build and my name, you'll probably find it. And it's, a, it's quite a, it's, it's one of the better ones. I didn't feel quite so sick after that one. Uh, so there's that, and then there's also a talk that I did about three years ago where I looked at a certain German design school and tried to investigate what that design school would do with something like web standards and the web, uh, were the web in existence in the 1920s and 1930s, which was an odd thing to do, but quite a, an interesting sort of investigation that I went on. So recently, I, I went back and read the notes from that again, and they actually felt more relevant to me now than they did three years ago. So I'm going to have a look at some of those ideas today. That cigarette's made me very dry. Apologies. Okay, so my job to warm you up a little bit. First of all, I'm going to share a certain hobby that I have with you. So I have many weird hobbies, not, not that weird, but, well, I don't know, we're all human. I collect the mistakes of designers, be they on the web or elsewhere. I see them daily. Thanks to the internet, these things are kind of crowdsourced and they bob to the surface. So I'm going to share a few with you today. These, to me, are ideas of, or examples of non-craft, um, or perhaps when craftsmanship goes bad, or maybe just plain stupidity. So I'll share a few of these with you. First of all, uh, newspaper designers are my favourites. They tend to make some pretty big mistakes. Uh, what do you think this pull quote says? Show you. Pull quote over five lines in here, here. Heary, heary, heary. Type over text. <laughs> Thanks. Love that one. Signage, as used out in the real world, on things like vans by people like Starbucks. Very good logo, Starbucks, until you use it on an open door on a van. <laughs> it's particularly popular in the UK at the moment, that one. Tax-related stuff. We're boycotting Starbucks en masse. This is one of my favourites. Um, a editorial piece about swimwear perfectly fine, uh, and the person who put this one together thought it would be great to have a nice headline, what about suit yourself, see, suit yourself, until you float that and reflect it in the sea. <laughs> Somebody's taken their eye off the ball there. Another one from newspapers, I love this. Jets Patriots jump head goes, Heary, brawl us. <laughs> Wonderful. Here's a little review or piece about the Sherlock series on TV, which is pretty good. It stars the beautifully named Benedict Cumberbatch. Or, as renamed by Spellcheck further down this page, Bandersnatch Cummerbund. Tremendous. Actually, a better name if it's impossible, but you actually, they actually topped his name. 
Ah, the web, the beautiful web. My favorite thing on the web is to apply an image treatment to every single image on the site. And if, for example, I was building an online store that sold boots, I'd definitely use a reflection. <laughs> you can just about see that. Brilliant, really grounds it, doesn't it? It's lovely. If my job as a designer was to brand and box up uh, Christmas lights uh, that flickered, I definitely tighten the kerning as best I possibly could. <laughs> this reminds me of the time I saw Clint Eastwood's name tightened very, very, very. That was not a good day. And finally, back to newspapers. I love this. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Little kind of contents there. What am I going to find in the, uh, in the classifieds? Oh, and deaths, of course. Very sad. So what about deaths? Well, deaths are coming. <laughs> You've been warned. All right, let's crack on. Um, totally unnecessary to the talk, that stuff, but why not share it? It's ridiculous. So let's get on to this idea of craftsmanship. I'll say craftsman. There are more than just men in the world, thankfully. I'll say craftsman. We talked about this at dinner the other night, and... I was kind of given the go-ahead. Don't tweet to the time. Some kind of horrible, nasty man. Uh, what moment or idea or item made you feel like a craftsman, if indeed you do? For me, it was a book. Uh, here it is. It exists. This book, The Bauhaus, uh, by Gillian Naylor, first published in 1968. This is the 1972 edition. It costs 90p. It's pretty amazing. This little paperback, or pictureback, was one of probably two or three creative books in our house when I was growing up. My parents weren't creative in the artistic sense, and they didn't know where this book had actually come from. They had the same lack of explanation for the adult books that I found in the shed. But that's another story, one that involved me being grounded. Anyway, I loved this book, and I would dip into it from time to time as I was, I was a young kid, a teenager, and I was kind of starting to draw and really experiment. And I loved it. I'd flick through and see all these images. And there was no pattern to it. It seemed to me this book was full of many different aspects and ideas and bits and pieces. It wasn't a book about art. It wasn't a book about furniture. It wasn't a book about architecture. And yet it was all those things. It fascinated me, really. So later I went to art school, as some of you might know. I learned a huge amount of art theory, analytical stuff, scientific stuff, the mathematics of composition and layout, and all these wonderful, wonderful things. I learned a great deal about painting and sculpture. I developed an interest in architecture, furniture design, uh, ceramics, all sorts of different things. I studied the isms, the, the phases of creativity in the grand narrative of art and design. I discovered a little about Swiss design, which fascinated me. Uh, I read manifestos. I learned about the Russian school and all these different things. I studied modernism. I learned most of this indirectly through the common virtues of materials, uh, form, light, space, color. Uh, but with the Bauhaus, the, the impact was very direct, and it made a continuing impression on me. Now, most of you will be quite familiar with this idea of the Bauhaus and what it did. So I'll skip the detailed history and get straight to the relevance that I see to craft and to web design. Now, one of the main objectives of the Bauhaus was to unify art, craft, and technology. The machine as far as these folks were concerned, was a positive element. And therefore, industrial and product design were very important components. Founder Walter Gropius called for a reform in uh, artistic process rather than a new style. He declared that art should be led back to its fundament and its prerequisite in handicraft, where it's possible to learn how to handle materials. One of the things Gropius said 
We can't teach you to be a genius, but we can teach you how to use the tools and ideas. He gathered teachers immersed in uh, theoretical practice. There were two types of teachers at the Bauhaus. Uh, teachers for technique and teachers for form. So this idea of theory and create, design and develop. This was the, the science of design in action. Students were encouraged to stop learning uh, on paper and to actually make models and begin to understand how things actually work in 3D, in reality. And the student would grow by, uh, as an individual by taking on board all these ideas and interpreting craft in their own way. As I was engaging with these ideas, I was uh, a visual artist, first as an eager undergraduate and then as a postgraduate in the real world, fighting for a place with grown-ups. It's pretty scary. By definition, I was becoming a craftsman. My life was materials, tools, process. I was building a knowledge and gaining experience around the creative pursuit that most interested me. Stuff that most mattered to my life, really. Most importantly, I was motivated to do this, to make, to actually create things. It was something I absolutely had to do. I had ideas I needed to get out of my system, whether they had an audience or not. So for me, there was a purity there. There was integrity. I want to talk briefly about influencers. Uh, as a designer, uh, as, a, as a craftsman, perhaps, you identify with ideas that relate to your own way of thinking. And we sponge this stuff up as we go through life, all our different interests. We immerse ourselves in hand-picked ideas, uh, manifestos and influencers, and things that we feel are relevant to us that inform our practice. And I'll share five with you here, just briefly. I have many influences, but these five in particular, for me, feel like craftsmen. When I think about them, I don't always think about their end product. I think about their process. This is the first one. This is a, uh, an absolutely tremendous uh, English painter called Peter Lanyon. He sadly died in the 1950s. He was a master of his craft, abstract expressionism, but actually about landscape, which was my interest as well. Very uncool when I was art school to be a landscape painter. Uh, but so, it's good to be uncool. And he was a real master of what he did. He cared so much about the perspectives he found to inform his work. He actually learned to fly a glider so that he could fly above the Cornish landscape, look down and make sketches. And he was a, what we used to refer to at school as a painter's painter. Nobody understood how to apply paint and make paint work like he did, not to me at least. And he was a mark maker, tremendous, absolutely beautifully skilled individual. Another one, this is Sir Paul Smith, and he's from my hometown. We're very proud of Sir Paul. Uh, he drinks in one of the bars I go to, which is very nice. He sounds just like me. Yes, there are two of us who sound like me on this planet. So he knows how I feel and I know how he feels. So Paul's very interesting to me because on one hand he's extremely successful. He has millions and millions of pounds and millions and millions of shops. But I'm interested in the man. He's still in control of the output of Sir Paul Smith as a company, or Paul Smith. And it's really fascinating to watch him in his office in London, where he gathers all this stuff around him, things that he collects, but also that people send him. And this is where so many of the ideas for new uh, collections and products and bits and pieces come from. And it's fascinating to watch him and listen to him when he talks through this stuff. The guy on the left here you might recognize as Brian Wilson, with his brother Dennis there. And the Beach Boys were very much before my time, just. But we listened to them in the 70s and even in the 80s. My parents had 20 golden greats, and I used to love it. And Good Vibrations was a song to me that was, as I learned more about things like the Beatles and the Beach Boys and, and pivotal moments in music history, I would home in on certain songs. Songs that challenged what was possible at the time. So Brian Wilson orchestrated 
this incredible song, Good Vibrations, by pushing the members of his band, the session musicians, and all the equipment that was available to them. He knew what he wanted to create and hear, but it wasn't possible. That didn't stop him. There's some incredible footage that came to light this year of the band recording Good Vibrations. It's on YouTube, and whether you like them or not, you should watch it. To watch Brian Wilson making this song and to see the joy on his face, it's incredible. It really is incredible. Uh, here on the right, we have film director Wes Anderson directing a young Frank Camero in the film Moonrise Kingdom. Didn't think anybody would get that one. Anyway. Uh, and Wes I love because when I think about his movies, I think about him crafting them. I think about him meticulously creating these worlds, worlds that are very much his. You could watch a film without knowing any of the credits and at some point think, this is like a Wes Anderson world, or this feels like Wes Anderson could have made this. He has a very idiosyncratic style, and I love that. And uh, finally, this man, who is the human equivalent of Chewbacca. He's six foot nine or something, and his name's John Baldessari, and he's an artist. But he's an artist who is also at home in graphic design and advertising and so on. He has a, a long and fascinating career. There's a film some of you may have seen, a five-minute film, again on YouTube, about John Baldessari, narrated by the wonderful Tom Waits, which in itself is just an incredible idea, and I would urge you to watch it. And you listen to the man, and you listen to the integrity, and you see him in his studio, and you think about the things he's done and the way he's worked, and the honesty he's brought into his practice and what he does, and it's very, very inspirational. Now, the reason I mention those five in particular is not because of their output, their final products, if you like, the Wes Anderson film, the Paul Smith shirt, whatever it might be. When I think about those folks, and sometimes I do, I just get a bolt out of the blue and I suddenly am thinking about what they do. It inspires me to get off my arse and actually start making and it's the idea of them in their studio or on location that inspires me. I think about them making, and I think I can do that too. I can be in that moment. I can be just like Brian Wilson or Paul Smith. I can be doing and making. And I do that with this idea of craft around me, and it makes me feel very comfortable and very excited. Thirsty work today, I apologize for all the quaffing. It's water though, it's not whiskey. So it's always interested me to find the parallels between art and craft and design. And it's something I've been aware of for 20 years or more. So much of what I learned as an artist, I've carried with me and applied to my work designing for the web. In fact, so much of what I've learned as a creative person, as a craftsman, has applied to many aspects of my life. Now, I had some success as an artist in kind of the late 90s for a while, um, and it was great. Uh, there was a series of steps, though, that took me to, into being a web designer, which I'll need to skip for now. But what's pertinent is that as an individual, I began to identify my own strengths and weaknesses. I began to identify values along the journey, or rather, the strengths and values found me, perhaps. I worked out the principles by which I measure my life and work. I discovered through making things what really matters to me. These very things identify me in the work I do. As an individual, I know what I love, and I know what I'm trying to achieve. I end up making things I love. I end up hopefully making things that matter, that make a difference. So what distinguishes the great from the good? And what makes some people really matter to us? I believe that the best people, the most interesting people, often inquire beyond what is necessary. They need to explore other areas, look at things differently, bring new ideas back into their work. With regard to this idea of the craftsman, I think that all of his or her efforts to do good quality work depend on this curiosity about the materials at hand. I think this is one of the key things. We, come, we become particularly interested in the things we can change, 
or influence. Truly creative people have an unswerving desire to inquire into their craft more deeply. Simply performing the core tasks every day is not good enough for many of us. We desire or should desire to broaden our knowledge, make new connections and discoveries, and find new outcomes. The subject matter will vary, but often people like us, we have a specific niche that we explore, something that matters to us all the time, that informs side projects or the work we do, uh, and maybe leads to writing books or people like me standing on a stage. I, I investigate stuff to such a degree that I need to find conclusions. That's why I do this, because it forces me to find conclusions in my inquiry. So with regard to the industry as a whole, I believe it's all of these individual lines of inquiry that have made us what we are, that have driven us to develop a greater maturity in this discipline of web design. And I'll come back to that later. So let's examine a few things that inform our craft. Foundations that we can be proud of, or maybe we can exploit further. If you're familiar with some of the ideas of the Bauhaus beyond what I've said already, you may spot a few connections or you may find some parallels. I think we've made similar leaps and drawn similar conclusions. So what do I mean by a progressive web? Well, for me, it's as much about looking backwards as it is looking forwards. I'm interested in how certain notions or ways of thinking inform how we feel about the web, how we see it evolving. And what we can do as both individuals and as an industry, as a, as a community, to strengthen and nurture the web day by day, site by site. So here's a big thing for me. This is the, like the building block, the very foundation that informs what I do on the web. This is how I see it. I'm not saying you have to. Acknowledging the machine is a very Bauhaus-esque thing to do. There's an honesty of construction, truth to materials kind of angle here. Our work would not exist without the machine, the computer, the mobile device. We've embraced the quirks and idiosyncrasies of the machine. We've recognized it as a moment in history where the computer de device enables mass production of our ideas, our content, uh, how it encourages communities and sharing. We've explored the machine We've acknowledged its limits, its problems, but we also recognize how we can exploit it further. At the very base of our craft, of our process, is the computer, the machine, the device. Seeking to understand what its real purpose is, is our daily job. We standardize production. You might be ahead of me here. Our industry grew at a fast rate without a responsible attitude or serious governance. The rise of web standards by forward-thinking, worldly-wise individuals and a community. This cemented our industry with a foundation of best practice. The adoption of web standards. The importance of using conventions. The role of testing, auditing, iterating. We nailed that. Earlier, I talked about all those individual lines of inquiry. So think about it. This idea of building upon others' findings, that shaped us all. It's why we're all here today. We come together to share our thoughts and ideas, to consolidate our thinking and our concerns. And ultimately, we have a collective desire to ensure the web is stronger tomorrow and the next day and the day after that. We defined web standards as a community who cared too much about our craft. We wanted order amidst the chaos. Off the back of that, we became an industry of mostly selfless practitioners, each determined to do their bit, to follow their own lines of inquiry, and then magically share those ideas. I was always too happy to work on some tricky problem for maybe three months, and then finally solve it. And then I'd write about it that evening and I'd give it away for free. And I was more than happy with that because the same night at least 10 other people would do the same. So they'd learn from me and I'd learn from them. In fact, I'd learn from 10 people or so that day.
Another key aspect, another foundation, if you like, of what we do that I think makes us think like craftsmen is this idea of experimentation and synthesis. I love the word synthesis. Just take yourself to a corner and say synthesis over and again. It's beautiful. Yeah, I'm never bored. We've sought to improve and uh, iterate our tools, our languages, our end results. We've learned how to mix and match and combine tools. In the spirit of the Bauhaus, I think we've brought together independent tools and learned to make them work together to solve problems. HTML and CSS and the DOM. Remember the DOM? Web standards is a perfect synthesis. Ajax, as we used to call it, was a perfect synthesis. Also very good for cleaning sinks, but that's an English thing. Mashups, APIs, manipulating data from numerous sources. This will go on forever, and we've no idea where we'll end up with it. But it's a beautiful experimentation in synthesis. I love it. Form follows function. This is us. This is the craft of the web. This is what we do. We break our complex web websites into layers of style and content and behavior and many other things. Look at our processes and how we analyze the need, the function. We really build without purpose. We take the time to understand the need and we respond to it. We aim for a complete design solution where form follows function. We seek to make visual impact without diminishing the function. So with this form follows function idea, we often find ornament and decoration is criticized. We strive for beauty, but not at the expense of function. We know how carelessness with ornament can ruin the user experience. But the flip side of that, as a designer, I would certainly say this, is that ornament can often enhance the experience. I think as an industry, we're managing this balance pretty well. We're an analytical industry. Like the modernists that I think we are, we recognize the beauty in the industrial components of what we do. We admire grids, typographic rhythm. We salivate over good code and markup. The modernists back in the 30s and so used to admire steel water towers for their simple beauty and function. And I think some of us admire beautifully crafted code for its very simple integrity. Yesterday, Owen Gregory, in his great talk, argued that with code, we just type, perhaps. He asked, is hand-coded equivalent to handmade? This is for you to decide, I think. It's not for me to stand here or Owen to directly inform you on that. I say yes. I say yes, hand-coded is like handcraft. Design in many forms can be considered craft. And that which underpins our design for the web is code. Code for me is craft. Code is admirable. It is beautiful. It doesn't matter to me that websites and code are often transient. I don't think impermanence should suggest that we value our work any less. Economy and simplicity in what we do. Accessibility and usability are at the center of our decision making always. We aim to construct meaning with economy without confusion. But as I've said many times, we can embrace complexity we shouldn't fear complexity at all. Simple isn't always best. Rather, we should seek to make sense of complexity, turn it into power, and look to find simple rather than simpler. But that's a whole other talk. Systems. Here's Collison again banging on about systems. I've done this for years. I don't care. You know why? It's because I'm a Bauhaus freak. So I love systems. I love order. I love structure. And applying this to what we do on the web is, is integral. At Bauhaus, they combined off the shelf with the new and creative. The, the backbone was often modular systems that are evident in architecture and product design and all over. Print design for centuries has used modular systems. Fast forward to something like the grid as we might understand it in web design. It was never a formal concept at the Bauhaus, but the Swiss took this on and really made it a feature of graphic design. So today, we consider the grid in our web design. We think about rhythm in our typography. We think about baselines. What's fun to me as a creative designer is that we can be transparent 
about our systems. We, we can learn to reveal them. Importantly, we can begin to think about these systems in, in a kind of holistic way, made up of more than just mathematical foundations, but also think about things like colour, type families, extensible navigation, our use of white space, light and shade, our attitudes to form and shape. These should inform the systems we build for websites. What we build is rarely finished, we know that. We build systems that flex and grow with a client, with a business, with an organisation, with a community. And I think once we have systems that we really understand, we can then learn to break their rules and be truly creative. Holistic approaches. I talked earlier about a wider set of influences. I think bringing the unexpected into our, into our practice makes us better craftsmen. Learn from theory. Explore other areas of inspiration. Graphic design, art, cinema, music, walking, sleeping. That's where I get most of my inspiration. I do a lot of sleeping. Build systems, embrace those. Fill your designs with these ideas, new methods of navigation. Take things from just unexpected sources. See what you can do with them. But we have to be careful with what we appropriate from elsewhere. As I've often said, we've, we've embraced a lot of print methodology but we must ensure that what we take is applicable to the web. A website is not a book. A website is not a brochure. It's not necessarily a poster. I want to talk briefly about this idea of crafting communities. I'm not sure I would have called it crafting communities were I not preparing this talk, but I forced it to a degree, but actually I looked at it and I thought, this sits rather well with me. Because with my work at Fictive Kin at the moment, what we are obsessed with is building communities around a product. And it's taken me a while to kind of reconcile this idea of building products, but that's kind of what I do. But these things wouldn't exist, they wouldn't survive, they wouldn't matter were it not for the people using them. So we take it upon ourselves as a relatively small team to invest a huge amount of time in building these fledgling communities around what we create. So here's something I've been working on for almost two years, and it's still in a closed beta thingy. So don't ask me for an invite yet. Um, sorry. And it's a beautiful music ecosystem. Uh, it does many things. Uh, one of the things it does is bring bands and artists and fans closer together. For each artist, and there's at least 150,000 on there already, we have these beautiful profiles. Um, fans are building these, putting all the information in, building them. For the first time, we're hoping to truly have beautiful, accurate, fleshy, wonderful artist pages that really matter, that really exist on the web. We've been bowled over by how our fledgling community has been adding to these, creating them just tirelessly putting information in. So we released this first and said, will people even want to put information into this system? And it turns out they do. But we're still keen to encourage them. It's, it's our job to encourage them and make them want to do it. So there's a couple of reasons why I think we're kind of crafting this. Each, each fan has a page like this. Custom backgrounds, they don't all have wood, anti-wood people, you don't have to have wood. Um, and it's an overview of the artists they've adopted and are working on and all the, all the artists they like and so on. And their achievements and their contributions and much more. It won't surprise you that we've built in a number of incentives to encourage them to keep adding information. So there are things like badges on there, although they do work in quite interesting ways. But what's nice about them is they're digital and analog. So we're actually rewarding our users, our fans, with these things arriving in envelopes, actual real things they can stick on stuff, which is kind of nice. When artists come on board later, the artists will be offering MP3s and hopefully tickets to people in certain areas and backstage stuff and all that. It's lovely. So how are we really managing this embryonic community? Well, we have a couple of tools that we're using to start with. The first is the 300. So basically, we have 300 users in this closed beta. Super passionate music fans. And we've got a sort of billboard chart thing going on here. 
where they can see how their progress is and measure what they're doing. And it's become very competitive. It warns them, ahead of the, the Sunday night when the chart is recompiled, it, it warns them how well or how badly they're doing. So we see as a whole how well we're doing. There's a lot more contributions, contributions than last week, etc. We can dig into that in even more detail. But each individual can also see how well they're doing. It's quite a nice thing. It's working really well. We also have something we call slash purpose. And all our sites will have a slash purpose. And we're also talking to some pretty big sites elsewhere that we would like to have a slash purpose. Maybe we'll host them all and maybe you know, we'll, we'll encourage more people to do it. It's essentially a manifesto for the site. So before you join, you can read this thing. You can see what we're trying to do. We explain our goals, why we're doing it, how we're doing it, what our journey so far is. We talk about things like your content. We inform you before you sign up that we will never close off your data. We tell you straight away, it will always be yours to take away. We're never going to close it. We're not those kind of people. And we, ask, we tell you how you can help us. Another thing we're doing are stickers. Just a couple of minutes. Uh, and stickers is the name of a new app that I think is going to be huge. It's the product of the Brooklyn Beta Summer Camp, which was a project last year where six teams were given a certain set of money in a time period to build something and then demo it at the end. Stickers is amazing. Basically, you create, you create a, 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 you record yourself and record a video, and then people post replies, and it creates a big, long sticker of videos. For every person who signs up to Rushmore, to the music app, we record them a sticker, and then we let them know about it. This is embarrassing, but I'm going to play it anyway. So here's an example that we recorded for somebody called Tuesday. Hello, Tuesday. Welcome to Rushmore. <laughs> you have a great name, and we reckon you're a great illustrator too. <laughs> Get contributing. Hello, Tuesday. Welcome to Rushmore. Feel free to use it any old day of the week. <laughs> so terrible. I'm sorry, Tuesday. You the best. Welcome to Rushmore. Hello, Tuesday. It's Monday. Welcome to Rushmore. It goes on. You get the idea. So we're having fun with it. It's not part of our initial plan and roadmap to invest time in doing that stuff. But as a team, we're encouraging each other to keep doing that. And it's wonderful when the new fans come on board and respond to the little stickers we've created. So we're really trying to make them feel at home. And then we have more traditional things like forums here, but the fans can give us very direct feedback. We can discuss with them. They can tell us what they're doing, what their problems are, which bands they've adopted, and so on. It works really well. So we have Laura, who you heard through the medium of Greg there, um, who's one of our community managers, if you like, but we didn't have an official title like that. So she's looking after users in that way. And then we have Andreas, uh, who is looking after support. Every time somebody sends a support ticket, they hear from Andreas. They get to know him. So that works really well. So I wanted to give you some example of the kind of stuff I was working on at the moment. And I think as an example of crafting a community, beyond just this idea of designing web pages and building these systems, there's much more to it than that. There's that whole depth and warmth and going beyond that I think we should all try to look for in the work we do. I think a key thing is just adapting and responding to the world around us. We know very little about where all this stuff is going. We know that we need to embrace the ebb and flow of the web, the shifting landscape. I lost the plot with web design about two or three years ago, and I had to just come to terms with the fact it would never slow down for me, that it will keep changing. And once I kind of realized that over and over again, I was comfortable with it. All those unique interaction patterns unique to what we work with, the medium we work with. We have to understand that medium, roll with it, exploit it, and be excited about it. We must never fear it. 
A good craftsman, I don't think, fears process. He or she will embrace it. In 2009, that talk I was referring to earlier, I was like many web designers, inquiring and thinking about the very rectangles that we work with every day. I'm obsessed with the bloody rectangle that we can't break out of. Back in 2009, I wrote, can we further explore and encourage the flexible liquid web? Remember those terms, liquid? We have this unique medium of expanding and contracting rectangles, devices of all screen sizes. We must begin to further identify best methods, methods for making the most of our content within fluid rectangles. That's about as far as I got. Many other people were writing very similar stuff at the time. A few months later, uh, if you've got a buzzword bingo card, by the way, you can already strike through responsive web design. It's coming. Ethan Market gave us the rules for responsive web design as he saw it because he needed to make sense of that particular problem, and he wanted to find an elegant answer. Craftsman that he is, he didn't settle. He pushed and prodded at something he felt he could change. The inquiries and desires of many were capped by one person's ability to simplify and then articulate. And he advanced our craft overnight. He gave us new possibilities. He pushed things forward. For me, it's important to hold certain influences and beliefs and apply them to our own practice. Much of the movements and those isms and so on that I talked about is applicable to the work I do now. It's applicable to my craft. We discover through doing, honing our skills over a significant period of time with substantial commitment. We understand the importance of our mistakes. We may be prepared to throw away perhaps 70% of what we work on and maybe keep a magical kind of 30%. But we know that the whole 100% was worthwhile, or we should. Our hope as we work is that peers, clients, and audiences will appreciate good craftsmanship amidst the vast world of thoughtlessness and indifference. Craftsmanship makes our work more meaningful to us, and it also spreads the perception that our profession is valuable. That alone is reason enough to continue investing every ounce of blood, sweat, and tears into every website and product we build. I think ultimately we need a little courage. We always need a little courage. I'm going to close with a piece from this CD. I actually own this. I am a bit weird. It's a collection of interviews from leading Bauhaus figures, including Walter Gropius, the founder. Listen to what he has to say and see if, like me, you feel it reflects some of what I've talked about and acknowledges from way back in history what we have done with web standards, with our industry, and with our craft. Go on, Walter. He's a bit shy. Go on, Walter. You should be bold. You should have the courage to be utopian and think out certain things which may be desirable for men to have. But in that moment, we don't know whether we can do it. But when you believe in it, and if you trust that we can do extraordinary things, then comes the problem how to reach that goal. And this goal should be reached in a very direct way that you do step by step everything realistically to come to that. In a similar way, I think the Bauhaus idea has very much utopian in it, but step by step we try to realize it, and we have given evidence that the possibility exists that a group of people can laboratory-like work on such an idea and come to a certain understanding which then has an effect to go out and radiate into other parts of this world. I, I think that sounds a lot like us. I really do. From back in time. But it describes us beautifully, I think. And I think we should be very, very proud of ourselves. And with that, I'm done. Thank you.